Start in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth. In earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the power and the glory and the glory forever forever in Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray amen amen evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice he hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me for they were many with me God shall hear and afflict them even he that abide in the bowl Selah because they have no changes. Therefore, they fear not God. He has put forth his hand against such as be at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. The words of his mouth are smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. But thou, O God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live about half their days, but I will trust in thee. I have read from Psalm chapter 55, verses 17 through 23. May the Lord have blessed to the reading and doing of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Welcome, everybody, to Bible Christian Fellowship of the Spirit. The title of today's lesson is The Essential Elements of Prayer. And Brother Paul will be our instructor today. Brother Paul. Thank you, Brother Doug. Welcome, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Shalom. Hope everyone's having an awesome day. This weather just cannot be beat today. Not too humid. Where I, I just got back from Southern Illinois, and oh my goodness, it's like in a sauna down there. 95, 97 in the shade. You walk outside right away. The sweats turn on. It's a beautiful day up here. We're going to take advantage of this. It's not a real long lesson. I'd like to welcome everyone um, to Bible Christians Fellowship of the Spirit that are watching the slides, those that are watching on the YouTube page, and as always, all the dear brothers and sisters on the conference call, welcome and happy Sabbath. Shabbat shalom to everyone. Again, the title of today's period of instruction is Essential Elements of Prayer. Seven is the number of completeness. So I chose the number seven. I chose seven elements today. Essential elements of prayer. There are other elements. Elements, not requirements. I started to name this requirements, but... There's not a lot of requirements, but there are a lot of elements, although there are a few requirements, and we're going to break that down and we're going to show the difference. What's disturbing to me as a member of the true church, as someone that to the best of my ability conducts myself according to the voice of the Lord or his holy word, is that when we deal with prayer, a lot of people, although there are lessons on prayer, a lot of people don't understand prayer. A lot of people don't even understand how to pray. And these are elements that we have to have um, or that are involved in productive prayer. Not have to have. There's a couple requirements. But these are elements that are required or that are involved in productive prayer. And this isn't a lesson on morning watch or getting up in the morning and any of that stuff I've done in the past. So without further ado and confusing it further, I still didn't get a smile. I can't get a smile out of no one. I'm afraid to tickle somebody because I might get popped. We're going to start this off in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. What we're going to deal with is just certain keys to prayer. And we're going to let the scripture explain it. Ephesians 6, and we're going to start this off with one verse, brother, verse 18. Go ahead and start our lesson, brother. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching thereunto with all perverseness. And supplication for all saints. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. This is part of that whole armor of God. And this is the main part of it, sisters and brothers. This is the part where you ask for help, where you ask for protection, where you ask and petition the Lord for certain things that you want or feel you need done. So this is the most important part. That's why we're praying always. With all prayer and supplication, but here's that little key to this praying always. In the spirit, praying always with all prayer and supplication. In the spirit. If you're not praying in the spirit, then you're not praying. 
Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We're always praying for each other, sisters and brothers. But I, I make that comment, if you're not praying in the spirit, then you're not praying. What does it mean to pray in the spirit? Let's go to Galatians, the fifth chapter, and we'll pick up that first element of prayer. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Or my first element of prayer. Again, I'm not, I'm not an authority on prayer. I just know how to pray. And I know how to teach others to pray. There's many elements in prayer. These are just a couple of key ones. Galatians 5, brother. And we're going to pick this up in verse 10. 5 and 10. Go ahead. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. See, he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. That's why we suffer persecution. That's why we treat those that are saints just like those that are enemies, or we're supposed to be. Because I know we don't. I don't always. I try. That's the key. You give it your best shot while you understand what it is that you're doing. That's why we're supposed to live soberly, sisters and brothers, so we always know what's going on around us. See, God has no loopholes in his laws and commandments, but rest assured, he has laws and commandments. Go ahead and continue, brother. And I, brother, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Well, wait, I thought the brothers are all, there's a, there's a group of brethren right now saying circumcision's been done away with, but Paul himself is telling you, Brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Paul never did away with persecution in Acts 15, or did away with circumcision, but that's for another lesson. Go ahead, brother. Then as the offense of the cross ceased, I would that ye were even cut off with which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. But by love, serve one another. That's what this liberty is all about, sisters and brothers. It's not to cut people with the flesh. It's not to tear people up. It's not to look down on people, make fun of people, beat people with the book. What this understanding is and what this liberty is that we have as servants of the Most High God is so that we can love and serve one another. Because that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Keeping the commandments of God, and the biggest commandment is love because it covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't take away from not setting up a tree and throwing eggs out in the summertime. But your whole conversation of not doing that is supposed to be done in love. Go ahead, brother. For all the law to fill in one word, even this. Love, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Yes, sir. But what, brother? But if ye bite and devour one another. Take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Yes, sir. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So in order to pray in the Spirit, sisters and brothers, we have to walk in the Spirit. We have to walk in. You cannot pray in the Spirit if you are not walking in the Spirit, the right Spirit. Go ahead, brother. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit is and the spirit against the flesh. Uh -huh. And these are contrary the one to the other. Yes, sir. So that he cannot do the things that he would. But if he would be led of the spirit, he not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifested, which are these: adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, em emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies. Even envying, murder, drunkenness, rebellion, and such a life, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So we have the battle between the spirit and the flesh. And this is the flesh, what we just got done reading about. Let's look at the spirit. And this is what we're supposed to be praying in, the spirit. So if this is your conversation, these fruits of the spirit, then you know you're praying in the spirit and you meet the first element. Go ahead, brother. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Uh -huh. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Yes, sir. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. And if you're living in the spirit and you're walking in the spirit, 
then you can pray in the Spirit. And only then can you pray in the Spirit. Go ahead, brother. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Yes, sir. Let's go to Psalm, the 55th chapter. Psalm 55. Psalm 55. Come down back there just a little bit, girls and boys. The children never are bad in this class. Praise God in Jesus' name. Just sometimes they get a little overzealous in their godly work that they're back there doing, drawing their Christian coloring sheets or whatever. Let's go to Psalm 55, and let's pick it up right there, verse 16. Psalm 55 and verse 16. We're talking about praying always in the Spirit. What does it mean to pray always? Do I always have to be looking up to heaven and throwing up some kind of words or petitions? Let's see what it means to pray always. Go ahead, brother. After me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall say, uh -huh. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and call aloud, and he shall hear my Evening voice. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. In other words, pray all the time. Whenever the need, you get filled with joy for some reason, praise God in Jesus' name. Throw up some offerings. That's a prayer. That's a prayer. You got some affliction on you or some temptation on you? Throw up that prayer. Father, give me a hand here, man. I'm struggling a little bit, but you already know this. I need your mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. Praying always means just that. Praying always. Evening and morning and at noon will we pray unto our God. So we're praying always. And how do we pray? Prayers are nothing more than words, sisters and brothers. It's talking one to another. That's why sometimes we're reading a dialogue and they'll say, Brother Devin, oh, listen, I pray thee. It's just words. It's just talking. He's asking, listen, man, check this out. Of course, when we talk to our Heavenly Father, when we first come into it, we think we're all King James Version linguists. Oh, Heavenly Father, thou knowest what I, what your servant the, the doest in thee and thou. And I mean, you can get crazy in the beginning. I did. I was so crazy in the beginning, I asked my elders when the day of Atonement came by where I could purchase sackcloth and ashes. And I still didn't get a laugh, but that's straight true. The day of Atonement was coming up. I was brand new in the Word, just got baptized, and I wanted to know where I could purchase sackcloth and ashes. Okay? Praying is nothing more than talking to your Heavenly Father. But there's a way we have to do that. Let's go to John, the 14th chapter. John, the 14th chapter. Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. i got to start letting out, stop letting out these little secrets from the podium, man. My Facebook page is going to blow up. John 14, John 14, and this is how we pray to our Heavenly Father. Pick it up, brother, at verse 6, 14 and 6. Go ahead. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man comes unto the Father but by Christ Jesus. And he is now our mediator. He is now our priest. He is the priesthood, always was. He is our priest. And when we sin or we are filled with joy or we're sad, we need to petition something, we go to the Father and we always say, in Jesus' name we pray. Because we're going to the Father. No man comes unto the Father but by Christ Jesus. That's why every time we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of our Christ or our Messiah. Go ahead and continue, brother. If ye, know, if ye had known me, you should have known my Father uh -huh. also. For henceforth ye know him and have seen him. And when you know Christ Jesus, then you know the Father. Because they're both one. And how they're trying to bring us back to the tree of life. Or give us back the right to eternal life or salvation. Go ahead, brother. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father. And it sufficed with us. Uh -huh. Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you? And yet has thou not known me, Philip? Uh-huh. He that have seen he that have seen me have seen the Father. And how askest thou then? Show us the Father. Uh -huh. Believe not, believe thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doth the works. So the Father dwells in Jesus because Jesus is obedient 
to the words of our Heavenly Father. So the Father dwells in Jesus, and then quite more naturally, Christ Jesus dwells in the Father because it's the same conversation. It's the same attitude. It's the same words. There's nothing different in the message of salvation. The Father gave it to the Son. The Son became obedient, so the Father dwells in the Son. Since the Son's obedient in the words of the Father, the Son also dwells in the Father. The conversations, the way they conduct themselves, the mindsets of pure righteousness are one and equal. There is no dark. It's all pure righteousness, all pure light. So the Father dwells in Jesus, and Jesus dwells in the Father. Now Jesus is trying to give us that same opportunity to have the Father and Him dwell in us, and us dwelling in them. Go ahead, brother. Verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very works sake. Uh -huh. Very verily I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works in these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And Jesus says, we are going to do greater works than him, and he told us if we don't believe that the Father sent him, believe in the works. And we're going to do greater works than him. And in one of the Gospels it says that if all the miracles that our Messiah had done and they could be contained in books, the world couldn't hold them. But we're going to do greater works than our brother Christ Jesus? Yes, because he's gone and we're here. And he's still here, though, because he's going to dwell in us. He's going to lead us and guide us, but we're going to let the scripture explain it. Go ahead, brother. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And whatever we ask in the name of Jesus, because we can't get to the Father except through Jesus. Remember, we're, we're filthy rags as human beings. In order to even have our prayer heard, we have to fall under that righteousness of Christ Jesus that shed blood. So the Father's not even entertaining us without Christ Jesus going on our behalf. Go ahead, brother. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. But there's a condition. Go ahead. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Anything we ask in the name of Jesus, he will do it. If we keep his commandments, because that's how we show we love him, by keeping his commandments. Go ahead, brother. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, uh -huh. even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, yes, neither sir. knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Because this comforter, or this Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, as it's known, it says, he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, this Holy Ghost and this, this Holy Spirit, most definitely, it is a, um, a spiritual being. But he doesn't come and jump inside each one of us. It's the message that our Savior gave us. And the job of the Holy Ghost or the Comforter is to open our minds to all truth or to reveal up to us things that are going to shortly come to pass. Mm -hmm. So this comforter or this Holy Spirit or this Holy Ghost is going to give us understanding. But if we're not walking in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, being obedient to our Messiah, we're not going to get that comforter. He is not going to open our eyes and our understanding if we're disobedient. He only does that to servants that dwell in him and him in us. Go ahead, brother. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Uh huh. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye, should, ye see me, because I live. Ye shall live also. Uh huh. And I mean, at that day, ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. And you're going to figure that out finally at that day when Messiah returns. That's when you're going to know for sure. Because up to that point, what are we living in? Faith. Hey, the substance of things. Seeing and things that I can touch and things that I know to be true? No. The things that you can't touch, the things that you can't see, that's faith up until the time that our Messiah returns. But then we'll know for sure that he is in us and we are in him and he's in the Father and the Father's in him. But we already know that, sisters and brothers, because when you take hold of this covenant, you see things in your life change for the best. And it's usually the peace of mind that changes first, not the circumstance and the situation. 
the way you handle things, the peace that the Lord puts us in. But this is him dwelling in you and you and him, and he does that through the comforter or the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. We call it the Holy Angel. It's not some spirit that gets up inside you and makes you act like a fool and utter crazy things. It opens your eyes to obedience so that you now have the choice to either take hold of it or to reject it. But by the time the Holy Ghost starts working with you, he's opening your eyes to obedience so that you can go ahead and continue to respond the way the Lord would have you do. Go ahead, brother. 21. He that have my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And that manifesting will come at the appropriate time, at the Lord's day. Let's go to 1 John, the third chapter. 1 John, the third chapter. So we have, we have to pray in the Spirit, you have to be in the Spirit. That's the first element. The second element is you have to go through our Messiah. To get to the heavenly father so we pray in his name our obedience gets us to jesus our prayers to the father through jesus gets us to the father first john the third chapter and we're going to read one verse brother verse four. First john three and verse four god's definition of sin go ahead brother whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law yes sir for sin is the transgression of the law whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law or goes against the law because sin is the transgression or the going against or breaking of the law. A lot of people like to stand on Paul's doctrine here. Let's see what Paul has to say about the law or the commandments. Let's go to Romans, the seventh chapter. We're going to read one verse and we're going to move. Romans 7. Romans 7. One verse, brother, verse 12. This takes all doubt off the table because Paul calls this moral law or those ten commandments that includes the seventh day Sabbath day. Listen to what Paul says about it. 7 and 12. Go ahead, brother. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. And you can read this on your own, sisters and brothers. This is talking about the Ten Commandments. But remember, Christ Jesus told Satan, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word, sisters and brothers. Remember that before you start kicking against parts of it. So Paul is telling you straight up right here, wherefore the law is holy. What law? The one that if you transgress or break it is sin? The law is holy and the commandment holy. What commandment? Same thing. It's law or commandment. It's commandment or law. Sin is the transgression of the commandment. Or sin is the transgression of the law. The one and the same. And he says that they're both holy and just and good. Because they have not been done away with. Let's go to John, the ninth chapter. What about the prayers of sinners? God heard my prayer when I was a sinner. I came straight to Christ just like I was. Filthy, wearing a black garment with no white on it. Different shades of black. Not even gray. I was filthier than filthy can be, sisters and brothers, when I came to Christ Jesus. And I came to him just as I was. Here's the key, though. He heard my prayer then. He heard it because I'm standing here in front of you now. He probably heard the, the prayers of my Catholic mother that used to read that Bible and used to preach it to me. And she couldn't tell me the Sabbath day to save her life, probably. But you know what? She read that word and she knew law and she knew obedience to the best of her understanding. Somewhere along the way, maybe I see her in the fire. Hopefully somewhere along the way, I don't see her judging me because I've condemned her already. But here's the thing, sisters and brothers. I came to Christ Jesus just like I was. But you can't stay there. That's the key. Once he starts having mercy, you have to respond. And that's the first key element. Then the second key element of prayer is going in his name. Okay? But what about the prayers of the sinners? John 9 and 1 verse, brother, verse 31. 9 and verse 31, brother. Go ahead. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. So we know that God heareth not sinners. Yes, he hears you when you've got nowhere left to go and you haven't already been granted mercy. He hears you just as you are, but you've got to respond when he shows mercy to you. Because he doesn't hear the prayers of sinners. He does not do it. Let's go to Proverbs, the 15th chapter. Proverbs, the 15th chapter. 
This is why that first element is one of the essential requirements of obedience. I'm sorry, First Peter, the third chapter, then we'll go to Proverbs. Thank you, brother. I got to do it at least once in a lesson to keep up with my personal standards, right? First Peter 3, I got to chuckle there, I'm getting funny. Look out, he's side splitting by the end of this lesson. First Peter 3 and 1 verse, brother, verse 12. 3 and 12, go ahead. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, uh -huh. and his ears are open unto their prayers. Yes, sir. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. That's why when you're dirty as can be, he'll hear you, but you've got to respond in order to keep them prayers being heard. Now let's go to Proverbs, the 15th chapter. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15, and we're going to read one verse in Proverbs 15, verse 29. 15 and 29, brother. Go ahead. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. See, the Lord just doesn't not hear the prayers of the wicked. He's far from the wicked. He don't even want to know they exist right now. He put them to the side. I'll deal with them later. I got other people struggling running this race that need a drink of mercy and grace. I'll deal with them other ones later. That's the attitude our father has. Somewhere along the line, I heard it liking like a window being open. There's the windows open, the screen, nice breeze coming through. He hears some whining. Who's that, son? Oh, that's Brother Paul. Oh, that Brother Paul that's over there that's that fornicator, liar, thief, murderer? Oh, yeah, that's the one. Shut the window and lock it. I got no time for that. Who's this over here? Oh, that's your righteous servant. So and so. Oh, man. What's he got to say? That's the way the father likes it, sisters and brothers. Whether you like it or not, he don't care. You see that little colony ants running around the sidewalk? Some of them get up in your house and you're looking at them. That's the way God looks at you. Got the power to reach out with one foot. Goodbye. He ain't no respecter of persons. No more than you are when you see 200 ants coming through your kitchen floor. Get rid of all of them. Scoop up a couple, you got a little mercy, take them out, drop them on the ground. We ain't nothing to our Heavenly Father. There's nothing that we can possibly give Him. Everything we have, He gave us. <laughs> Everything that we have, He created. Everything that we have that is good is from Him. All our knowledge, all the understanding in the world, skyscrapers, pyramids, everything. It's all knowledge and understanding from Him. There's only one thing he asks. And he asks by saying, this is what I require of you if you want to do it. Be my son, be my daughter, obey my voice. That's all he says. That's all he says. Proverbs 15, one verse, brother, verse 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. Let's go to the 15th chapter of Proverbs. 15th chapter of Proverbs. Brother, let's pick this up at verse um, I'm sorry, uh, 28th, uh, 28th, uh, wait a minute, what am I doing here? 28th chapter of Proverbs, please. Uh, yeah, 28, and 28th and 28 and 9. I'm getting this all turned around again, but you know what? I don't care. 28th and verse 9, brother, because we're going to get this message across. Verse 9, go ahead. He that turned away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. So now, not only do we not have the prayers of sinners being heard, even though he'll hear our prayer when we pray, come to him. But now if you're walking straight and you start turning and you turn away from the word or from the law, he says even your prayer shall be an abomination before the prayers of the wicked he didn't want to hear. But the prayer of a righteous man that turns away from the law, now it's an abomination. So here it is. If you're not obedient to the word of God, he's not even going to hear your prayer. If you turn from the word of God, your prayer is an abomination. That's scary. Vengeance belongeth to me. I will repay it. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let's go to 1 John, the second chapter. And we're going to pound this home one more time. And then we're going to go ahead and continue. 1 John 2, 1 John 2, and brother, let's pick it up at verse 1. 1 John 2 and verse 1. Go ahead. 
My little children, these things write I unto you, uh -huh. that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, yes, sir. Christ the righteous. Yes, sir. And he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world, whole world. Yes, sir. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. How do we know John's telling the truth? We just read Jesus tell us that not long ago. And Christ Jesus told us that if we're obedient, then he's going to send a comforter. And we know his job is to further open our eyes to what our Messiah brought us and what he told us. Go ahead, brothers. Verse 4. Yes, sir. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Uh -huh. But it, uh, whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby I know that we are with our in him. So he says, I, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. We don't need to expound on that. Anybody teaching that the moral law has been done away with and the dietary law and the circumcision and all the commandments that the Lord gave us is a liar and there's no truth in them. That's coming from the book, sisters and brothers. Don't say Brother Paul said. No, God said in 1 John, the second chapter. Go ahead, brother. Jump down to verse 21. Yes, sir. I have oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I forgot. I took that one out. Cut that off. Skip to 21 and 24. That was something else. Let's move on. Let's go to Matthew, the 21st chapter. See, I'm in the lesson. I'm not as far out as sometimes I think myself to believe. Matthew 21. I just didn't let you get in on that one. See, now all chances of any more laughing just went out the window because everybody's going, Brother Paul just made you go about the fool. <laughs> Matthew 21. I still can't get over. Will you girls start listening to me back here and laugh at me a little bit? Make me feel good, please. Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Let's look at the third element. Essential element of prayer. Matthew 21 and verse 22, brother. Go ahead. And all these whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believe ye shall receive. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. So we're walking straight, we're walking in the spirit. To the best of our ability, we got that love going, we got that light shining, right? We're drawing people toward us. And we're not even preaching, we're just living. And people want to know about us. They see this peculiar stuff going on, right? So now we're praying always, and we're praying in the Spirit, and we're going in the name of Jesus to the Father. We're going to the Father in the name of Jesus. Now we're praying, and we're asking for something. we got to believe that when we're walking straight and we're asking the Father in Jesus' name that we're going to receive what we're asking for. But these are all elements. They all have to be there. Let's go to Matthew, the sixth chapter. Let's back it up a little bit. Matthew the sixth chapter. Matthew six. Matthew six. Matthew six. And we're going to pick this up at verse one. This is another essential element of prayer. Six and one. Go ahead, brother. Take heed that you do not that take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, he have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. Uh -huh. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Uh -huh. But when thou doest alms, let, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand do. Yes, sir. That thine alms may be in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Yes, sir. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and in corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Yes, sir. Go ahead, brother. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father. Father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Yes, sir. Go ahead, brother. Verse 7. But when ye when ye pray, use not vain repetition uh -huh. as they even do it, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Yes, sir. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask. So now this would let me address the first thing here, this repetitive prayer. This doesn't mean that you keep praying the same thing over and over again. You're laying in your bed and you're saying, Oh, Father, give me patience, give me patience. And you say it 300 times and you fall asleep saying it. 
That's not repet repetitive prayer, sisters and brothers. Repetitive prayer is not ten Hail Marys for our fathers or whatever the Catholics used to have you say for penance and all that foolish vanity. That's not repetitive prayer. That's not repetitive prayer at all, sisters and brothers. The Heavenly Father knows what you need. Asking for the same thing over and over again is not repetitive. Repetitive prayer is when you make a show, a spectacle out of yourself. And you do the same thing over and over and over and over again. To show that you have some type of understanding or that you have the ability to do some type of gift that was never given to you, such as speaking in tongues. They take you, you get baptized in some congregations in the Sunday, brethren, and they put you in a room and they have you say the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And then when you start saying it, you might pick the pick up pepper, you start tongue tied. Now you're speaking in tongues. Oh, praise the Lord. That's repetitive prayer. Saying the same prayer because you have a need or a godly want for something is not repetitive. That is casting all your cares at the feet of your God. Let's look at some of the rest of this here. He says, when you pray, go into your closet to pray in secret. Brother, does this mean group prayer is null and void and out the window? Absolutely not. What the Lord is talking about here in these first eight verses is not to make a show of yourself. Oh, I'm some righteous guy. I'm going to go stand on the street corner like this, and I'm going to stand there and just start praying to God in front of God and everybody for no reason whatsoever. Like the Pharisees used to do when they were fasting. They'd go and they'd stand outside the temple and oh, I'm fasting and be all sad and everything and not washed. Oh, and they'd be praying. There's nothing wrong with group prayer. In fact, group prayer back in the day when I first came into this, we had a group of people that to the best of our ability, we have just come into the word, we were walking straight, we were gathering a couple times a week and we would gather together and we would pray together. And every time we would pray together, somebody would come up by name. Sometimes a couple people would come up by name. Before we had the opportunity to sit back down as a group and pray together again, one of the names that came up in prayer, we'd come across. Even if it was just to say, hello, how are you doing? Sometimes they'd show up at the next group meeting, to the next Bible study. There's power in group prayer. But what the Lord is talking about here, when you pray earnestly for something, don't let everyone know, make a spectacle, look at me. Go in quiet and petition your heavenly Father. Walking straight, going in the name of Jesus, believing what you're praying for, and then spend time alone with him. Doesn't mean you shouldn't pray as a group or a family. This is just the way you petition your heavenly Father on your own. Let's continue. This is 1 Kings, the 8th chapter. 1 Kings, the 8th chapter. This is why we open in the beginning, sisters and brothers, the way we do. This is why, and this is another essential element. Not a requirement, but it's an essential element. You don't always have to do what we do, but we open up the class and close the class, as one of my teachers said, because we hedged the bet for our prayers to be heard. 1 Kings 8. And let's pick it up, brother, in verse 41. 1 Kings 8 and 41. Go ahead, brother. Moreover, concerning the stranger that is not of thy people Israel, but coming out of a far country for thy name. That's someone like me, a stranger, not a physical Israelite. Go ahead, brother. For they shall hear of thy great name, and of thy strong hand, and of thy stretched out arm, when he shall come and pray towards his house. And I heard of the Lord's greatness, and of his terribleness, and his mercy, and his grace. And when I heard, I responded. So this is talking about strangers. Go ahead, brother. Hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger called it to do to thee for. Uh -huh. That all people of the earth may know thy name, to fear thee, as do thy people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by thy name. Now this is Solomon, and he's petitioning the Lord right after he built the temple in Jerusalem. His father David got everything he needed, stockpiled it for him. He wanted to build the temple. The Lord said, no, you're a warrior. You will not build my temple. Your son will do it in peace. And so this is Solomon after he took everything his dad had stockpiled for him, and all these other gifts and things, and all these nations were given him, and he made this grand temple, and he petitioned the Lord. And he, this is, there's more to this prayer than what we're reading, but we're just cutting straight to the point. Skip down, brother, to uh, verse 46 and continue. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, 
and thou be angry with them and deliver them to the enemy so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy far or near yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land whether they were carried captive and repent and make supplications unto thee in the land of them that carried them captive saying we have sinned and have done perversely we have committed wickedness and so return unto thee with all their heart with all their soul and the land of their enemies which led them away captive and pray unto thee towards their land which thou gave us unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, the house which I have built for thy name. So now the Lord is talking about Israel. He, he petitioned the Lord for Israel in other areas, but the two that we're dealing with the, that are the two that affect us today. The bondage and the stranger. There's if Israel goes out to war and they pray toward this and all these other things, but we're not dealing with those right now. So this is the nation of Israel in bondage. If they turn to you, Lord, and pray toward this temple, and they turn back to you. Go ahead, brother. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. Uh -huh. And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions when they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before them who carry them captive, that they may have compassion on them. So that's what the Lord thought when Solomon petitioned the Lord. And then the Lord turned around and answered Solomon. And told Solomon, I have heard your prayer, and my eye and my ears will be upon this house perpetually or forever. So that's why we pray toward the temple. Because the Lord said he will always hear prayers that are prayed toward the temple. Of course, we have essential elements that are involved in those prayers. Let's continue. Let's look at another element. Let's go to Matthew, the 17th chapter. Matthew, the 17th chapter. Matthew 17, and we're going to deal a little bit with fasting. We're not going to deal with, well, we know how to fast. You don't eat, you don't drink. Matthew uh, 17, and pick it up at verse 19, bro. 17 and 19, go ahead. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And we'll deal with that account a little bit uh, in the next scripture in Mark. Go ahead, brother. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So it was because of unbelief they couldn't cast out this spirit. Because of their unbelief. And these are the disciples walking with Christ Jesus, probably seeing so many miracles. Oh, man, what's he want now? You make another 5,000 people. Get the baskets ready. Fine. They've seen so many miracles, it's just everyday stuff to them. It's like somebody that's broke all of a sudden gets a job making 40000 a year or more. Your whole life changes. It becomes your a custom norm. They were so used to our master doing miracles. Can you imagine that? You get so used to seeing your God and your king doing miracles that they start to bore you. Human heart, they probably did start the war. The, the book says he did so many miracles, the world couldn't contain the books if they were written in books. Isn't that something? And their unbelief is the reason that they could not cast out these demons. Their unbelief, albeit this kind go without, not but by prayer and fasting. Verse 21. This only goes on by prayer and fasting. I didn't even let you read it, did I? That's all right. You get to read it, Mark. Let's go to Mark the ninth chapter. Mark 9. Mark 9. Mark 9. And this is basically the same account. Let's pick it up at verse 17, brother. I'll let you read it all this time. Mark 9 and 17. Go ahead. And one of the monks to answer and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which have a dumb spirit. And that dumb spirit doesn't mean the kid don't know two plus two. This dumb spirit is throwing him around, throwing him in the water, throwing him in the fire, fire, smacking him around, making him hurt himself. In other words, dumb, like he's got no understanding. He's ignorant, lack of understanding. Go ahead, brother. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and, gnash, and gnasheth with his teeth uh -huh. and penneth away. I speak, I mean, I'm sorry, I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. Uh -huh. And he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? 
How long should I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Oh, faithless generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? This isn't a question he's asking that requires an answer. This is one of those rhetorical questions. You faithless gener generation. How long am I going to be with you, man? How long am I going to have to do this for you? Bring him to me. He's like, come on, man. Let's get that faith moving here. Disciples, go ahead, brother. And they brought him. Unto, and they brought him unto him. Uh -huh. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. Yes, sir. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. Uh -huh. And oftentimes they had cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Yes, sir. And what did Jesus, Jesus say? And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And this is an absolute true statement. This is another absolute. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now look what this man asked Christ Jesus. Some of us, all of us, ask this prayer at one time or another when we're praying for something and we feel that little doubt creep in or that little bit of of waver and creeps in. This is what our prayer should be. Go ahead, brother. And straightway the father of the child cried out, and with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. That's the human heart, sisters and brothers. Look at Peter. Jesus walking in water, on water in the storm, said, Peter, come here. Peter said, Lord, come here. He got out of the boat and started walking. And he's walking on water. John or somebody in the back probably said, yo, dude, you're walking on water, bro. What's up? I'm what? Ah, oh, Lord, help me. He's sinking. His faith went just like that. That's why we got to guard the heart all the time. But this man asked him, Lord, help thou mine unbelief. Go ahead, brother. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee. Come out of him and enter no more into uh -huh. him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead. Yes, sir. And so much that many said he is dead. Yes, sir. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? That's a good question, Lord. Why couldn't we do it? Because there's other gospel accounts that they're amazed that they're able to cast out spirits. Where Jesus cautioned them not to get puffed up. Don't be puffed up because you're casting out spirits, but rather that your name is written in heaven. So they come up to him and say, well, Master, why couldn't we do this? And what did Jesus say, brother? And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. There's power in prayer. Sisters and brothers, sometimes it requires fasting. I don't normally go into my own belief from the podium, but I believe what the thing with the fasting is, when you get all that food and all that drink out of your system and your system's cleaning up from that food and everything and you don't have so much waste inside you, it opens you up because your body is more pure on a fast than it is while you're eating. But I can't prove that. But it sure sounds good. I know that when I'm in a fast, as much as I hate fasting on the Day of Atonement, my prayers feel more alive. Even when I'm thirsting, if I throw myself into prayer, it's like the thirst goes away. I've never fasted for more than one day. Very seldom have I gone more than 10 minutes past 24 hours without at least getting a glass of water or something as I'm feeding the family. But I know sisters and brothers that have fasted two, three, four days. Brother Devin did it one time for two or three days, I believe, or a couple times or whatever. And he can probably attest a little more to fasting that when you're in that spirit of praying and fasting and your body is free of all that stuff that the food and the drink can bring on, you're just in a different place. And another place, I think it's Isaiah 58, the Lord says that his day of atonement or the fast that he called is so that your name can be heard on high. That's what fasting is all about. To ensure your name is heard by our Heavenly Father through Christ Jesus. 
So that's the sixth element. We have walking right, praying always, praying through Jesus, through our Messiah or our mediator, believing what we're praying in. Even when we pray in group, get time to pray alone, to pray alone, okay? Praying toward the temple is the fifth. The sixth element that I brought out in this lesson is fasting. And the last element that I'm going to bring out is the right spirit. We have two places. Let's go to Psalm 34, chapter first. Psalm 34. And again, there's more elements in prayer. Okay. These are just seven that I happen to pick for today. Psalm 34, brother. And let's pick it up at verse 9. 34 and 9. Go ahead, brother. Go oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. We're saints. A saint is a servant. Or one that has taken hold of the covenant. Go ahead, brother. For there is no want to them that fear him. Uh huh. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Yes, sir. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Uh -huh. What man is he that desires life and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Go ahead, brother. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Depart from evil. Seek peace and pursue it. Go ahead, brother. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are upon are open unto their cry. Uh -huh. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. To cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. And we've read that over and over and over again in less than 18 scriptures and 106 or some odd verses. The Lord does not like wicked. He does not like evil. He abhors it. It's an abomination if you turn away from being his servant if you pray. The Lord is serious about this, sisters and brothers. Go ahead, brother. The righteous cry, and the Lord hear it, and deliver them out of all their troubles. All their troubles, yes, sir. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Uh -huh. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. They have one scripture. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. That's that coming to God as you are when you're wicked and filthy. Because when you earnestly come to him and you're wicked and filthy, you got that that contrite spirit. You got that broken heart. You're on your last leg. You never went to anybody for nothing. You grew up thinking if you're a man that if you want something, you got to take it by the hand and you got to grab it and you got to go and make it happen and do it. And if you're a sister and you're dependent on a man and that man is wicked and you're trying to run that household the best you can, you're trying to do what the Lord would have you do. And you get to a point where you got that broken heart, contrite spirit. And if you're one of these strong sisters that's out there and you're in the workforce and you're working and you're getting it done and you're climbing up the corporate ladder and doing everything else, and all of a sudden by the time you see you need to come to God, you got a broken heart and a contrite spirit. It doesn't matter who you are, how strong you are, how much whatever resolve you got and going ahead and getting ahead and making things happen. It don't matter. When you got that broken heart and that contrite spirit, and you come to God, he hears you. Because he wants to change you. And he wants to mold you. And he wants you to be at peace. Because he does love you. But he's a, condi a conditional God. That's why a covenant has two sides. If one party keeps it, the other party will keep it. One party gives a promise and says the other party has to fulfill their end of the agreement. When that end of the agreement is fulfilled, then that party fulfills the promise. A conditional God that does love you and wants you to come to him. That's why this scripture right here says what it says. The Lord is dying to them that are of a broken heart and save as such and be of a contrite spirit. And once you're there and then he starts revealing to you and you start responding, the broken heart never goes far away in that contrite spirit. It just takes on another form with another definition. But you never forget where you came from when you were serving a God. That's why you're always guarding your heart. That's why you're always standing close to the world. So you can bring the world to him when they see the need through you. 
when they see your peace and your contentment and your conversation is straight and moral to what they understand as being moral because they don't understand the commandments of God. But then they see you and they're at a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Now God will hear their prayers and you can help bring them to where you're at. But that's where it starts, sisters and brothers, that broken heart and contrite spirit. And when you have that, that obedience follows. Go ahead and continue, brother. Verse 20. He that keepeth all his bones, not one of them is yes, broken. Sir. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. God's not slaying the wicked. God's not. They're slaying themselves. It's the wickedness that they do that's slaying them. The only thing God's going to do when he returns is lay that judgment down. Next, Paul Mazalusi. Oh, teacher. Woo, yeah, you did pretty good, son. But what about right here? What about this? What about that? I'm going to lay it all on the table. And prayerfully, I hear, you know what? Well done, my faithful servant. Step right this way. No swimsuit for this guy. He makes it. Give him a roll. Go ahead and continue, brother. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. None of them that trust in the Lord shall be desolate. Let's go to Luke, the 18th chapter, and this will be it. Luke 18, and this will be it. Not too bad. About an hour so far. Luke 18. And before we even start reading this, I'm going to tell you straight up. We've got to incorporate a little bit out of both of these parables if we're going to be pleasing in the sight of our God. Luke 18, and, and I'll explain as we go. In verse 1, brother, go ahead. Let's bring us home. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Always to pray and not to faint. In other words, not to, to get that standoffish. When you're, when you're feeling like you don't want to pray, when everything is just kind of ho-hum in your life, it's not real good, it's not real bad, and yeah, you think about God, and you get up in the morning, and Facebook takes you away a little bit longer out of the book than it should have or whatever, and you're just in one of them ho-hum, just everything's just kind of moving along, and it's one of them little routines that you got, and then you get in, in, into the, those little routines, and, and then you kind of you think about reading and you think about praying and you kind of think about God, but it's just kind of like the whole home attitude. You just kind of drag it along. That's faint. Don't faint. We ought to pray always and not to faint. It's in those moments where we get um, lackadaisical, where we get too comfortable, that we can start slipping to the side. So we're not to faint, not to sit back and rest on our laurels. We're supposed to continue to move forward, continue to grow, always pray, don't faint. Go ahead, brother. Verse 2. Saying, there was in a city a judge, which here is not God, neither regardeth man. Uh -huh. And there was a widow in that city, and she came money on my adversaries, and he would not for a while. But afterwards, he said within himself, though I don't regard man, Yet, because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And we, if you're a parent, you know this. You know that. You know the, the mindset of the king right here. Daddy can have some candy. No. Daddy can have some candy. No. Daddy can have some candy. I just told you no. Daddy can have some candy. Honey can. No, I just gave him some. No, you can't. Half hour. Daddy can. I'll okay, pay already. Go get some candy. Oh. Thought of any sober sink and thinking goes out the window. They keep asking, they keep asking, they keep asking, they keep asking. It's either that or finally you get up and say, listen, man, how many times I gotta tell you? You keep asking me, I'm gonna have to, we're gonna have to talk about it. I'm gonna have to punish you somehow. I'm gonna have to strap you with the belt, or I'm gonna have to put you in the corner or no candy for a week or something, but you gotta quit asking me. But sometimes it just keeps going and going and going, and you just let in. Well, that's the mindset of this king. He's tired of hearing it. And he's going to answer this widow. Okay, I'll give you what you want. What is it? So what does our Messiah say, brother? Verse 6. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Uh -huh. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. 
Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? That's a good question. That's a darn good question. But here's the whole point of it. When you're crying unto the Lord and you're doing it with the right essential elements of prayer, he's hearing your prayer. And he's hearing it speedily. He's listening. Christ Jesus is praying. Who's that praying? Oh, that's Brother Paul Mazzalusco. Oh, my brother. Follow oh, my son. What does he want? That's what we want to get to. We don't want to be like the other example of that Paul Mazzalusco shut the window. We want to hear, what does my son want? What is he asking me for? Can I give it to him? Can I do it for him? That's the mindset we have to have. We have to have these elements of prayer so that when we go to our God, he wants to talk to us. Because it's through prayer that we communicate with him and that we ask him for things and that he grants us what we want. He's already given us what we need when we're praying. It's for things that we want. Go ahead and continue, brother. Verse 9. Yes, sir. This gave this parable unto servants which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised us. Uh-huh. Two men went up to, into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a public. Uh -huh. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this public. Uh -huh. I fast twice in the, week, in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the public is standing afar off, would, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. So now nothing wrong with the Pharisee. The Pharisee is keeping the commandments of our Messiah. He's doing it to the letter. I fast twice in the week. I get tithes of all that I possess. I'm not an adulterer, extortioner. I'm not unjust. Or even as this publican here. It's his attitude. It's the attitude that the Pharisee has that's got God shut in that window. Who's that? It's the Pharisee. I don't want to hear him. Who else is out there? Oh, this publican is asking for mercy. Oh, what's he got to say? It's all about the right spirit, sisters and brothers. And it starts with that spirit of love because love covers a multitude of sins. You start with that love and then you incorporate with what the Lord gives you in understanding. But it's about having the right spirit because the right spirit, no matter how diligent of a servant that you are, can get your prayers cut off because you become disobedient by that one thing you lack. The right spirit. Doing all the commandments and statutes and judgments of our God with the right spirit, with cheerfulness and with gladness in your heart. Because without that, your prayers won't get heard either. One more verse, brother, and we'll end this. Verse 14. Yes, sir. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. So that's my seventh essential element, the right spirit. We've got one, walk and right. The second element is we pray in the name of our Messiah, Christ Jesus. The third element is that we believe in what we're praying for. The fourth element is to spend time alone with God, even if we're in prayer groups and all this. Because there is power in group prayer. And we, we just saw it recently. We won't go into it, but we just saw power in group prayer recently. And it always happens according to his will. The fifth Key element is praying toward the temple. The sixth is fasting. And the seventh is having the right spirit. So I thank you for the opportunity to rightly divide God's word. And I hope somebody learned something from this lesson.